I can't believe what I'm gonna say to you. What the fuck? I made a whole video going down the rabbit hole and guess what was at the bottom? I was working on a disturbing list as I do the other day and when I do this I scour the internet. I look through IMDb for hours, I take your recommendations because you guys are just as sick as I am and you have a lot of good ones. It takes forever to find films that I have never spoken about before on this channel because I have been here for over a decade now and I have countless videos on disturbing movies. But the strangest thing happened this time when I was searching the internet. I came across this disturbing iceberg. There's a couple of different versions of disturbing icebergs, but this one I hadn't seen before. And something really drew my attention down to the very bottom, the darkest corner, Engineering Red. I have never heard of this film. And I searched my comments for all of my videos and you guys have never mentioned it either. So today I thought for a treat, let's really push it to the limit. And I mean it, I very much have. The research for this video sent me into a spiral. Like, I am not going into the deepest, darkest parts of humanity without warming up first. So let's start at the top and work our way down. I've timestamped everything for your convenience. And I'd like to say thank you to the anonymous poster who has now been deleted from Reddit for making this, but I maybe won't be thanking you by the end. But before we get into it, I do want to thank today's sponsor, which is Surfshark. And Surfshark really helped me out, as they always do, when trying to find some of this content online, because it's not easy. It really isn't easy. Surfshark is a VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network. Not only do they encrypt your data and protect your safety when you're online, they also can unlock geoblocked content. So say if I had to be in a different country in order to watch something, to rent something, to find something, all I have to do is type in where I want to go and I'm there within seconds. I also love that one account you can have on unlimited devices. So I can have it on my phone, on my laptop, on my smart TV. Unlimited devices for the same price, which is crazy. No one's doing that anymore. Why not secure your safety with Surfshark today and give it a try? You can check it out by using my link in the description down below. And even better, I have a deal for you. Use the code word SPOOKY for four extra months months for free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for making my life easier and helping me watch content online, which without you, I would not have access to. Okay, let's dive into the top of the iceberg, starting with Megan is missing. I'm surprised that this one is at the very tippy top because it has some pretty serious content compared to what's to come. Megan is missing is a found footage horror drama about two teenage friends, Megan and Amy, who while going through their own teen struggles, befriend a stranger online. The film really relies on the found footage aspect as it's extremely rough and it's made on quite a low budget. The news report inserts manage to break the spell of the found footage and cheapen the overall atmosphere but the film does have some pretty brutal content and it was heavily criticized for its graphic content in one scene in particular. In 2020 the film gained popularity on TikTok and rumors began about how it was based on a real story but the film isn't based on one story overall. Instead they research similar cases which you could probably argue most films have to do in part of building authenticity but although many demonize the film it's actually endorsed by the class kids film foundation. This was a research and rescue resource foundation who were proactive in the involvement of missing children. Sadly, they have just announced that they're shutting down, but they promoted the film and said that it raised awareness. I do think that this movie has a strange way of doing that. I mean, it's not really attracting the right audience and it's sending a bizarre message instead of promoting safety. But I can definitely see why it's on many icebergs and I truly think it should have been lower down. James Wan and Lee Winnell Baby Saw was a pivotal film for the horror genre and it arrived just at the right time. The mystery horror is often put into the torture porn category, but because it's got a crime detective element, it made it a little bit more palatable for a wide audience, leading to an expanded franchise that continues today. In this original film, we watch two men wake up in a strange room with a dead body in between them. Now they must figure out why they're there and how to escape before time runs out. I would highly 
highly endorse this as an entry level to disturbing films, if that. Firstly, if you're not watching the director's cut of Midsummer, you are doing it wrong. The extended version adds so much important context, and for me, it transforms the arc of the film. Starring Florence Pugh, we follow Danny, who travels with her boyfriend and his friends to a rural town in Sweden to experience an authentic Midsummer festival. But what begins as a way to experience a tradition turns into a life-changing nightmare. Look, Ari Aster is known for making people's stomach drop. But this is no the strange thing about the Johnsons. Although Midsummer has some unsettling aspects, once the first scene is done, I do feel like the worst is over. The film is more about pushing the audience out of their comfort zone and exploring grief and dependency than attempting to disturb them. But in saying that, this is a film that could be challenging challenging for some audiences and perhaps not the best first date watch. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I am a huge fan of this franchise. The original film is a testament to the psychology of filmmaking, being that there is hardly any gore and the film relies on its grit and suggestion to create a horrific atmosphere for the viewer. It is disturbing definitely, but it's pretty tame in the grand scheme of things. It was more disturbing for the 70s when it was initially banned in several countries due to violence. Violence. And there is an amazing book about the production process that I really recommend. It's written by Gunnar Hansen himself. But there are many conflicting stories about the true inspiration. While people think that the film is based on Ed Gein, he wasn't the main inspiration and a lot of the film was a grueling process that required improvisation. But Gein worked as a great marketing ploy to drum up some commotion. Leatherface and his family are a great gateway drug to disturbing smutty film. Heading back to the mainstream, Seven is now Next, and it's one of the highest rated films on this whole iceberg, currently sitting at 8.6 on IMDb. Directed by David Fincher, this crime thriller is about two detectives who hunt a serial killer whose crime scenes are inspired by the seven deadly sins. I would say that this film is less gory than Saw, but it's on the same caliber as Disturbing. Although with the latest information about Kevin Spacey, a rewatch will send chills down your spine. I see Seven to be more of a crime mystery, and although it's disturbing in parts, most of the reveals are left up to the imagination of the viewer and I know you know what I'm talking about. And it's up to you. If you find that makes it more disturbing or less, I would love to hear your thoughts. Congratulations thus far, we've made it to the second level of the iceberg. The House That Jack Built isn't the most disturbing Lars von Trier film, but it is brutal. The crime drama horror is from the bizarre perspective of a psychopath who turns into a serial killer. The film works on multiple levels as we watch him justify his crime in an interpretation of Dante's Inferno, which is really interesting because this is also mentioned in Seven, which we just talked about. But my thing is, how deep on an iceberg can a film be that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival? Although it was reported that more than a hundred really emphasis on the quotation marks here. More than a hundred people walked out of this screening. But then those who stayed gave it a six minute standing ovation. Okay. Sure. The film is unsurprisingly brutal and violent, but the context of the ending does soften the blow. Mind the pun. As a Tusk lover, I have no idea why Tusk is here. Tusk is camp for me. It's silly, goofy, and strange. And it's a horror that is genuinely straightforward with its message. This body horror directed by Kevin Smith follows Justin Long, who plays an arrogant podcaster who takes the chance on an interview feeling invincible, but he may have met his match. The tone of the film is a dark comedy, especially with the over the top stereotype of the conceited lead actor who feels like he's untouchable. But the film definitely has a dark edge to it, but I find it really hard to be disturbing because it's so campy. I know a lot of people find this film to be disgusting because of its body horror element, but for me, it's so over the top. I just really don't find it that disturbing, but I know it makes a lot of disturbing lists, so I don't know if it's just me. Whoever made this iceberg seems to have a soft spot for body horror and surrealism, and we will see this more as we go deeper. David Lynch's fantasy horror Eraserhead marks the entry into disturbing surrealism as we follow Henry, a factory worker who discovers he is the father of, let's say, a bizarre baby, driving him to the brink of madness. This film is Lynch dialed all the way up, challenging the audience to piece together the narrative. The atmosphere is crucial with the film being in black and white and set in a strange industrial world. 
and the soundscape is filled with his iconic droning. Many view the film as an exploration of the anxieties of becoming a first-time parent, although, as with much of his work, Lynch has refused to explain the film, believing it would rob the audience of the power to interpret it as they see fit. I don't find this film to be overly disturbing. The body horror is all practical and very prop-based, which makes it, for me, more of a unique wonder, but I'd be crazy not to admit it instills a visceral sense of unease. Okay, The Human Centipede is another film that I consider camp. It is wacky. It's a concept that is intended to be ridiculous, especially with the performance of the late Dieter Laser, who plays a mad, evil doctor. In the film, we watch the classic archetype of two American women lost in the woods after their car has broken down. It's storming, and it just so happens that they find themselves at the mercy of this zany doctor who uses them along with another man in possibly the sickest experiment you can think of. Well, that was before the sequel. Even though the premise is horrifically outrageous, it is literally based on the idea the director Tom Six had when talking to his friends about the worst punishment possible for a human. The film is sick. I'm not totally out of touch yet. I do know why it's on this list because it crosses many lines and just when you think it's bad, the digestion starts. Of course, this deserves to be on an iceberg. Hard to follow the human centipede with the next level down starting at Mother. Mother is an anxiety inducing ride that feels relentless, not allowing the audience to catch a breath. But it's also a beautiful film that is masterfully layered and one that I would put closer to the top of this iceberg. Because like Midsummer, Mother is more of an experience and a journey. The film directed by Darren Aronofsky is the story of a couple whose lives fall into turmoil after uninvited guests disrupt the peace of their home. The film is an allegory for Mother Nature and mimics many biblical texts. There is one scene in particular that is highlighted as disturbing and crossing the line, but in terms of the iceberg, I'd put Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream down as more of a disturbing film than this. But in saying that, it did cause Jennifer Lawrence to take a year off from working. She said that the film was an experience she never wanted to have again. Damien Leone's Art the Clown has quickly become an iconic villain, and he appeared in two films before Terrifier, The Ninth Circle, and All Hallows Eve. But I believe at the time of this iceberg, this was his most brutal film. Of course, that was before the sequel. In this film, we watch a maniac clown terrorizing a town on Halloween night. The film receives some criticism for its violence against women, especially for a brutal scene, which is pure splatter. And it's a very interesting juxtaposition in this film between the gore scenes and the slapstick performances, which I think personally adds to its unnerving atmosphere. The actor who played Art has described his performance as an evil Mr. Bean. He was inspired by actors like Charlie Chaplin and Jim Carrey. Terrifier is a disturbing movie for sure, and I'm not going to take that away from it. Would I put it next to Mother? Probably a little bit further down. Look, I didn't make this iceberg, and I'm just as surprised as you are that the remake for I Spit on Your Grave is listed instead of the original. I Spit on Your Grave is notorious for its brutalization, and it fits in the rape revenge category of horror. The movie tells the story of Jennifer Hills, who is residing in a cabin while writing a novel, but she is brutally assaulted by three locals in a horrific, and I tell you horrific scene. This movie then turns into a revenge tale where the tables of violence are turned on the perpetrators. These films, all of them, the sequels, the original, they are intense. In this 2010 film, the lead actress had a safe word that she could use during the filming of the assault scenes just in case she needed to take a breather. The film and the original are very hard watches and I totally agree with them being on a disturbing iceberg. The Golden Glove is a crime drama horror centered around the German serial killer Fritz Honker, who viciously murdered women in the 70s. The film is adapted from a novel based on the true crime case, and it offers a gritty and unflinching portrayal of this dark period in Honker's life, capturing the bleak and desperate nature of his story. While I'm not particularly fond of this film, it might be worth watching if you're interested in true crime narratives. I've noticed fans of Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, often appreciate this one as well. It is a disturbing film, mainly because of the matter-of-fact way it's delivered in an entirely uncomfortable and claustrophobic space. I'd probably put it above the last film, I Spit on Your Grave, but I do think it does have a place on this iceberg, and it's probably at the appropriate level. But I'm perplexed by freaks being on this list. Although the film shows the inhumane treatment of outcast sideshow performers in the 30s, it did so 
much for the representation of people with disabilities. And again, this was in the 30s. Although this film, of course, is not perfect. But then again, it's almost 100 years old. The film is a poetic drama about a circus trapeze artist named Cleopatra, who takes an interest in sideshow men hands. But not everything is as pure as it seems. Top Browning, the director, was inspired to make the film after growing up working in a circus. One of the taglines for the film is the story of the love life of the sideshow. It's a piece of classic cinema and at its heart, it's more of a cautionary tale of love and greed. I don't find this film to be disturbing at all. Perhaps those at the time felt different, but I think it's a classic piece of film and I would never put it, especially this low on an iceberg. This is one I completely disagree with. John Waters is known for his trash hyperbolic films that push all of the boundaries, most set in the violent high crime backdrop of Baltimore. And although Serial Mum, Crybaby, and even Hairspray have more of a structured narrative, they still contain that essence of Waters' freaky nature. But Pink Flamingo really makes a mockery of cinema and that constant hunt for being disturbing or more so being filthy. This is also because this film was made before a lot of strict safe filming conditions were enforced by the industry, allowing a lot of strange stuff to happen on set. The movie is listed as a dark, raunchy comedy and it's about a notorious sleaze Baltimore criminal, Divine. She lives with her mother and they are both determined to be remembered as the filthiest people alive. But competition comes in the form of a couple whose list of of immoral hijinks may put their name to shame. Now the battle has started between the players and all bets are off. This film is well known for the scene where Divine eats dog poop and it's real. It's 100% real. John Waters was famously quoted saying, it was just a piece of dog shit and it made her a star. I'm really surprised that the dog poop scene is such a big deal and everyone talks about that because there is a chicken scene in the film that really messed me up. All I can say on YouTube is that this scene involves simulated sex acts. And I love John Waters, but this is totally horrific, absolutely horrific. If you wanna see a film where two groups are trying to out filthy each other and it goes beyond anything you can comprehend in kind of a campy way, this is it, but I'm telling you, some of the scenes in this film, it is insane. That Personally, I feel like the dog poop part is nothing. I would call it a walk in the park compared to the rest of the film. And now it's time to head down to level four. And the torture gets worse from here, unfortunately. Cannibal Holocaust is another film that utilizes real animal cruelty amongst other taboo elements, which caused it to be banned in several countries. The found footage horror is the story of a documentary crew who travels to the Amazon to capture a cannibalistic tribe on film. But six months later, their footage is found. The film is brutal from start to end, and I don't really believe in the ways that are expected. Yes, there's cannibalism, of course, and it is depicted in a realistic manner, especially for its time. In fact, the practical effects got the filmmakers in trouble, with the director having to prove how they were made just to avoid jail time. But it's the animal cruelty that is often cited as one of the worst aspects of the film. This is because Unfortunately, it is real. Other taboo elements include an intense sexual assault scene, which later was disclosed as not being simulated. Of course, it was acted, by a couple at the time. The film leaves a bad taste in a lot of viewers' mouths. And although it was championed when it first became a cult classic, I feel like people have finally turned on this film. It is infamous for its video nasty reputation. Unlike the first Human Centipede, the Human Centipede 2 loses some of its cliches and changes its tone dramatically. This film is a meta story about a recluse who becomes obsessed with the first film, leading him to create his own centipede. It is a lot darker. I would not call this film camp. And although the lead Martin feels like a surface level villain, they really dial it up with some more nefarious themes such as sexual abuse and a horrific scene with a baby. It truly earns its place on this iceberg. And I think a lot of people just think about the first one and don't really consider how disturbing the second one 
actually is. I do have an interview with the actor who plays Martin, which I'll link if you're interested. And look at that, Lars von Trier strikes again on this iceberg, and in true von Trier style, Antichrist is a heavy stylized art piece that manifests the idea of grief and sadomasochism in one film. Broken into chapters, we watch Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg, a couple who are experiencing grief after a tragedy. They retreat to a cabin in the woods where their emotions transform into strange visions and violent sexual behavior. The film stylization is overtly dramatic, making it a taxing emotional watch from start to end. You have to go into this film prepared. It's a glaring study of anxiety, and depression, but I probably wouldn't put it under the Cannibal Holocaust, especially not next to this next film. I feel like Silo should be one level down at least. This is one of the films I don't discuss often on my channel. I've seen the film once and every time I attempt a rewatch for research, I just can't do it. It's a tale of non-stop debauchery. Silo is a period drama set during World War II in Italy as we follow four fascist libertines who torture a group of boys and girls subjecting them to sexual and mental torment. This is another film on the list that has ties to Dante's Inferno, this time in the structure and the chapters of the film. Many famous disturbing film directors cite it as one of their favorite films, such as Michael Haneke, who said that he only watched it once and it was unbearable, but it's still considered one of his favorites. The film has some of the most disturbing scenes I've ever seen. It's pure torture filmed in a way that appears to be almost like found footage, it holds shots for a very long time, rarely changing angles, and it just does not cut away. I would personally put this much lower. This film, although fiction, it is a hard, hard watch for me. And it's time to descend down again to the next level, level five. A Serbian film is well known for its assault scene, but because most of its reputation is through word of mouth, many people are unaware of its traumatic conclusion, which is truly one of the most shocking moments in cinema. The film follows an aging porn star who agrees to participate in one last film before retiring. But little does he know what he is signing up for. The film crosses all the lines. It is a brutal watch with a lot of blood and violence and uncut sex scenes. Just as you thought it couldn't get any worse, it spirals into the darkest parts of humanity. Only a few countries have issued ratings for the uncut version, and it's one of, if not the most controversial wide release film of the last few decades, and it greatly deserves to be on every iceberg list. I know many people refuse to watch this film, and I can totally understand why. This is one you'll never be able to forget. This next film is the only other film on this iceberg that I hadn't seen before doing this video. Well, other than the very bottom, which we're getting to. But this film is known as The Wedding Trough. I'm so sorry to laugh because it is very disturbing. I feel uncomfortable. It's known as The Wedding Trough or The Pig f Movie. I feel honestly like this is way too far up the top of the iceberg. This art house drama has no dialogue. It's presented in black and white with an intense mixed classical soundtrack. In this film, we follow a secluded man working on a farm. We watch how he strangely interacts with the animals, but takes a liking sexually to a pig. A lot of what happens is off screen, thank God, but the film only gets more disturbing from there when the piglets arrive. The film is thought of as an allegory for the rejection and obsession of mankind, and it contains a lot of worrying animal scenes and deaths. I have been tested in watching this film. I regret it immensely. I did not enjoy this film because of the troubling way it was filmed. And this is a classic case of I watch them so you don't have to. I would not recommend it. The director for this film has been quoted saying, my character has no specific psychology nor even less pathology. He is a man of flesh out of any precise cultural context outside of time. He is a ghost who inhabits the screen for an hour. I leave the spectator a total freedom of interpretation. I wanted to put in the film such a multiplicity of signs that one can find matter for teaching or fascination. I actually find Begotten to be quite tame in the company of others on this 
level. This is another experimental fantasy film. This one is a silent horror movie and it does feature imagery that is both cruel and barbaric. But although its artistic style depicts graphic scenes, it does serve a deliberate purpose. The film tells a surreal story about the death of religion, the exploitation of nature by humanity, and a nihilistic view of existence. In a way, it has a slight resemblance to the themes of Mother very slight. Despite its limited distribution upon release, it was well received and it has become a notable classic in the experimental horror genre. While disturbing, it is an intriguing, captivating film that I would tell you it's worth a watch at least once if you're up for some taboo troubling images that is. Come and see. Wow, this is a beautiful daring film that really penetrates the viewer's soul. The film broke me and for a good reason. It's a total masterpiece. This war epic is the story story of a young boy who finds a rifle and joins the Soviet resistant movement. We follow him as he experiences the horrors of World War II uncut and up close. The cinematography of this film is impeccable and the action scenes are so well orchestrated. It's so smooth and it's paired with intense subject matter. And I'm not gonna lie, I cried the first time I saw this film. It is very effective and it's an intense experience. This is a disturbing film that like the last one is worth the watch. It really is. It's beautiful and horrific and will never let you go. Okay, are you still with me? Because it's a steep decline. We're on level six and things are getting scary. I have watched all of the Japanese guinea pig films. I have a whole video breakdown on these. And honestly, I do find them to be disgusting and vile, but very over the top. Once you get past the plot and the setup, it's more of an interesting experiment in practical effects. Although the devil's experiment is probably the most deplorable in terms of the story. The movie is about men who kidnap and brutally torture a woman. The movie is only 43 minutes long, making it more concentrated but some of the practical effects and I guess goofs within the film you can see someone missing contact several times really breaks the spell of the film and it doesn't make it feel so realistic especially in comparison to some of the other ones this low on the iceberg. I feel very desensitized obviously. I do think with the Japanese guinea pig films their reputation precedes them. They have aged a lot but at their core they are brutal very brutal torture splatter films and I think that was the filmmaker's intent. Okay now we're getting into the real dark stuff, Faces of Death. This is a splatter horror collection of clips that markets itself as true found footage, boasting the experience of graphic death close up. This mockumentary is hosted by a coroner who is showcasing the expression of a dying face, aka faces of death. The catch is a lot of this film is real. 60% of it is sourced stock footage depicting accidental death, autopsies and killings. But the more up close and epic scenes that are very alarming because you don't know how they would have obtained any footage like this, well, those are fake. So the flesh eating cult or the monkey scene, which the film is quite famous for, the monkey's actually cauliflowers. But part of the controversy of the film is the inability to tell which scenes are fake and which are real. The film did turn into a cult classic in the underground splatter scene. And this inspired several different forms of sequels and more recently, there is a remake. Right now it is called Faces of Death and it has a more structured story, but it is about several characters who are obsessed with these kinds of pieces of imagery. And it's based around the found footage of the original film. It has a pretty intense cast, including Barbie Ferreira. And they were even talking about how Charlie XCX is going to make an appearance. This original film honestly gives me the creeps. I seeked it out in my teens and never again, I'm good for now. Thank you. But this iceberg is not done with me <laughs> because next we're gonna talk about snuff 102. Much like Faces of Death, Snuff 102 or Snuff 102 is a series of clips depicting torture and death, this time in dark web style through the perspective of a reporter who was very interested in the subject matter. It kind of sounds like the remake or what they're attempting to do with the remake of Faces of Death. The film shows the reporter being fascinated by the idea of snuff, but then they get too close to the subject. The Argentinian film starts with a warning that all of the torture depicted in 
in the film is real. And from there, it jumps straight into the depravity, which is basically grainy, suggestive scenes intercut with animal death. The narrative story throughout is filmed and stylized in black and white, accompanied by soft piano. It's a very poorly constructed story that's sole purpose is to shock the viewer, attempting to thread a relatable story of caution for its demographic. Look, she's into disturbing cinema too. And look what happened. It doesn't really make any sense to make a film about that or that to be the subject of morality. It ends up being an exploitive patchwork of gore and vile sounds. And if you aren't already on the FBI list, you may be after attempting to watch this one. I would not recommend it. Not worth it. Okay, we made it. We're at the bottom of the iceberg. August Underground. Of course, you had to be on this list. This film comes with the tagline, the sickest film ever made and it does live up to the reputation. From the start, it's one of the most deplorable, depraved things I have ever seen, opening with an intense scene of two men torturing a woman. And it is scary realistic, just petrifying. The level of detail in this film is shocking. It's hands down the most disturbing minute of any film I've ever seen. I can't show you a lot of what's happening in this film on screen, which is why you're seeing me talk right now. There is nothing I could show you possibly from that first minute. It is insanity. While the film only runs for 70 minutes, I do feel like it may be 70 minutes too long. The film follows two men as they brutally assault, torture, and kill multiple victims. But unlike other snuff-inspired films, August Underground is entirely fictional, featuring original content that is is horrifically believable. The improvisation in each scene combined with the intentionally poor framing and practical effects makes the film feel disturbingly real. If you're looking for the most vile and realistic depiction of depravity, this film, it fits the bill. It's awful and it's undeniably believable. It's so realistic, especially for the films that are surrounding it in this part of the iceberg. <sighs> I hate that I have to talk about this film, but I chose to do this video, so I have no one to blame but myself and my morbid curiosity. I watched Slaughtered Vomit Dolls many moons ago, and this is not a rewatch that I will ever be willing to do. This is a Canadian surrealist exploitation film that claims to have coined, I don't know why you would ever claim this, but it claims to have coined the term vomit gore. Many who watch this film end up regretting it. The film features disturbing and graphic content as its main plot and despite attempting to follow a narrative structure it spews, mind the pun, I'm sorry, the same chaotic scenes until it finally ends. The story follows Angela, a teenager struggling with mental illness who turns to sex work and as her condition deteriorates she experiences a series of grotesque and horrifying hallucinations based around death let's say. Overall, it's a repulsive film. It's utterly, it's trash. It's awful. I would not recommend it to anyone. Lucifer Valentine, who created this film, has made several different kind of spin-offs, sequels with the same characters and similar atmospheres. He's also a very controversial person with many allegations following him. Not someone that I would support in any way. Don't watch this film. Don't do it. I did it so you don't have to. Which leads me to the moment. It is now time that we finally watch Engineering Red. I don't know anything about this film. I thought, what a fun experiment to just go in blind. Come with me, let's go watch Engineering Red. Let's go, I guess. Hi friends, it's a little bit later, it is dark. <laughs> I can't believe what I'm gonna say to you because this is not what I expected after spending hours making this video. This is obviously the last part I'm filming. That film wasn't disturbing, maybe at all. <laughs> I made a whole video going down the rabbit hole and guess what was at the bottom? Not a bad film. I mean, 
it wasn't great, but uh, it was interesting. And I am perplexed that anyone would put that below everything else that I've had to watch, rewatch, or re-encounter for this video. I do apologize for the crickets. It is late at night. It's 11 p.m. now. It's just part of the vibe. So Engineering Red turns out to be a surrealist, believe it or not, Russian film, which was released in 1993. The script was inspired by Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, and they do put this at the start of the film. The film has three different parts, but it also goes in between like a surrealist kind of element, which I'll be able to show you some clips of that. This kind of stuff with some documentary clips, what I believe is sourced from different stock footage and then also I believe personally that this is spliced in with what the director and filmmakers created. More experimental footage of humans being spliced open, cut together and done in a really interesting way. I want to say I am not someone who would consider themselves to have a strong stomach when it comes to medical footage. I don't really seek that out. That's not something that I'm really into. I would definitely look away if I saw anything that I thought was too intense for me, but the medical footage they show in this, even people being cut open, I found to be purely, if we remove the narration, it seemed to be very straightforward and done in a scientific sense. So I didn't find it disturbing at all. The documentary of this film splices together, which is probably the worst way to phrase that, which looks to be stock footage of these procedures along with medical anomalies. And with the voiceover, they're suggesting the idea of making artificial humans for the Soviet Union. It is really creepy and interesting the way they put it together. And I think it's more fascinating than anything. I think of it more as art. I just can't believe how low this is for a film that's really well constructed in trying to tell a story with all of these different, it's like mixed media. I found the footage to be really fascinating. The idea of building a human is paired with this music that's both curious and strange. And they have this subliminal kind of like heartbeat that comes in and out of the sound. The way everything is layered together, the narration, with this footage that sometimes is original, sometimes is stock, then the music and the sound effects, I think it is repurposing something in a really interesting way. As the film goes on, it plays this kind of light, classical, playful music, along with darker imagery. It's trying to get a rise out of you, it's trying to get a reaction. But again, I just felt it was very music video, very on the nose with the juxtaposition and contrast. In the surrealist portions, which are just, they just come out of nowhere. Uh, there's a lot of footage of a woman and the narration of her using passages from the Magic Mountain book that we mentioned earlier. She's narrating the dying thoughts of a soldier, basically. I say the film is gory. There's no doubt about that. If you're showing that kind of footage, it's undoubtedly gory, but it's so fascinating the way it's put together. It's so experimental and it just feels really different to anything else on this iceberg and anything I've seen in a long time just completely repurposed and changed into a new story. I think that that's so clever. I do think it could be more disturbing if more of the surrealism and footage of the woman was taken out. There's a lot of that that really cuts up the scenes when they're getting intense and it doesn't feel relentless like a lot of other films on this iceberg to watch. It feels like it's giving you breathing room and space to kind of go into the next part of the journey. In a way, this film reminded me of Poor Things. I Not at all, but at the same time, the idea of reanimation and then bringing someone to life and talking about them in that way felt like some inspiration for poor things possibly. The one part I would say is super graphic is there is the separation of conjoined twins. I, again, don't think I'm good with medical footage I don't seek it out. That's something that I probably would leave the room if it was playing, even in an educational sense, but I didn't find it to be disturbing at all. And the fact that they showed it trying to make disturbing is a little bit troubling. You basically watch as kids grow up and then you watch uh, twins, very young baby twins being separated. And although they, I feel like they're trying to distill some nervousness in you, 
I didn't feel that. It just felt very educational. It wasn't very bloody. It really had a minimal impact and perhaps because it was real footage sourced, I think if it was fake, they would have put a lot more gore and blood into it, but it felt very clean. <laughs> I know that's a weird way of saying it, but trust me, I'm more surprised than you. I feel like the film is more suggestive in its editing than showing anything actually disturbing. It's more about the idea of what it could be than what we're actually witnessing. I did find a quote from the director though. He said that he achieved his goal, two or three people really vomited while watching, the effect was worth it. Who are these people vomiting at <laughs> these films? But th he went on to talk about how this film was shown at a film festival. And I really believe anything that is worthy enough to be shown at a film festival, screened and shown to an audience, probably doesn't belong that deep down on an iceberg. That was a journey to say the least. Thank you guys so much for coming along with me. This was a very tough video to make and I just can't believe it ended like that. But that is cinema going in blind and seeing what happens. I'm actually really happy with that result. Although I think something more disgusting and depraved would have made a better video, but that's cinema, baby. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I do have a couple of tier lists. If you haven't checked them out, I have a new one in there talking about my favorite horror themes and subgenres. I hope you'll stick around for more content and I'll talk to you all very soon. Bye friends.